So thank you for having me here. And uh, uh, my talk will be very mathematics. And uh, this is something that I have done for the past four or five years, but not when I was here like some time ago. Working? Yeah. OK. So first of all, <coughs> I guess everyone, everyone knows what a measure means. But uh, non-atomic W stochastic measure, I'll, I'll go along as uh, I'll go over the slides. So first thing first, uh, so that we, we, we are on the same page. Uh, this W sto stochastic measure is just a measure that has uh, both of its marginal being the Lebesgue measure. Okay, so it, it has been studied for many years, like probably 50 years now. And uh, I'm gonna look at this W stochastic measures on just the zero one squared. Okay, and you can think of this as a continuous analog of the W stochastic matrices. Okay. Now, because in in my talk, this measure, this DSM, will be factors. So in order for me to to define what it means by factorization or product. I have to look at it from another point of view as a Markov operator. So a Markov operator is just a positive operator that maps the characteristic function on zero one to itself. And the adjoint of this T also maps the characteristic function of zero one to itself, okay? And recently, like 20 years ago, there is a one-to-one one -one correspondence between this DSM and the MO, the Markov operator. Uh, and it's defined this way, okay? So if you have a Markov operator, you can construct a DSM and you have DSM, then you can build or define a corresponding Markov operator, okay? Now, the, the Markov operator, it, it has the comp uh, composition, okay? As a, you have two Markov operators, you compose it, you get another Markov operator. And with that, you have a product of DSM induced by that composition operator, okay? And that composition, that product of the DSM can be defined this way, okay? You can think of it as a product of two matrices, right? Because you can, you can look at this as, as uh, mu on one, one, one axis, and this will be new on the other axis, okay? Uh, there's a typo here. That should not be the product here anyway. Okay. Now with this product, you have an isomorphism between the DSMs and the MO. Okay. Meaning they are just about the same thing. And in 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 the side of the Markov operators, you have this uh, special Markov operator that is defined by the measure preserving function phi. Uh, measure preserving mean, meaning this. Okay, that maps F to F of phi, okay? <coughs> and the identity operator is one of them. Now, because we have the identity operator in the class of Markov operators, you can, you can define what, the, what it means by being left invertible, okay? So this T sub phi will always be left invertible whenever phi is measure preserving. And the, the inverse of it is the adjoint of phi. So I'm going to show you pictures of the Markov operators. And you can look at these Markov operators as just uh, the DSM. So when you look at it as a DSM, it's actually can, it can be represented by the support of the measure itself. So the identity operator has support on the diagonal. And the invertible one will be supported on a graph of one to one on two function or measure preserving function. Okay, and left invertible Markov operator can be looked at as a, uh, a measure with support on this kind of function, okay? And the right invertible is just the uh, transpose of the left invertible, okay? Now in 96, there's a surprising result that says if you have a Markov operator, you can factor into a right invertible multiplied with a left invertible. One, always. 
this is a very surprising result back there. And uh, the question is, when can a Markov operator can, uh, can be written as a product of a left and a right negotiable? I mean, this would not be every Markov operator. It, it's gonna be just a subclass of operator, okay? So I'm, 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 what I'm doing here is just the opposite order, that's all. Okay, now there was some study involving extreme points that involves this uh, multiplication of left invertible and right invertible. So I'm gonna tell you what it means by extreme point first. Extreme point is just the point in a convex set that cannot be written as a convex sum of two other points, okay? So it's, it's like points on the boundary outside, okay? And uh, the DSM or the W stochastic measure, they form a convex and compact set. So by the cry newman theorem, this DSM will be closed convex hull of the extreme point. And that's why extreme point is very uh, important, okay? Then in, in 72, Chiflet, uh, they disproved the conjecture that the extreme points of the set of Markov operators are characterized by those operators which factor into a left times right, okay? This is not true. And they disproved it by constructing two examples. One is uh, extreme Markov operators that cannot be factored into this left times right. Uh, the other direction is they construct a left times right that are not extreme. So meaning they don't have anything to do with the other. Okay, but we're gonna come back to this later uh, in the very end. Now my work, I feel like my, my work is, is dealing most, mostly with uh, non-atomic copula. Uh, sorry, non-atomic DSM. And in order to define what we mean by non-atomic DSM, uh, we have to define what, the, what it means by a sigma algebra. The associated sigma algebra of a DSM is just, uh, you collect all the Bs that has this property, okay? Put it in, in one class. And you collect all the A that, that satisfy this property and then put it in, the, in another class. These two classes will be sigma algebra, okay? And examples are like this. If you have this left invertible Markov operator, it's gonna be, uh, the B will be any set on the vertical line, okay? And the A will be the corresponding set when you take inverse image of this, this B. So obviously, the sigma mu on the vertical axis will be everything, the Borel set. Uh, the sigma star on the horizontal axis will be any set which are symmetric with respect to one half, okay? Now with this correspondence, uh, we have some properties like the following. Uh, these are not, th these are too technical, but I want you to see this, uh, th this two bullets here. The first one is, if it's left invertible, then the sigma t on the vertical one will be the Borel set, and if it's right invertible, then it's gonna be Borel set on the horizontal, okay? Now, a non-atomic double stochastic measure, what, what are they? I mean, uh, non-atomic was used mainly to define uh, sigma algebra. So for a sigma algebra to be non-atomic, it must have no atom, no, no atom, right? So what is an atom? Atom is just a set that, is, that doesn't have any proper subset measure-wise. That's all, okay? So any proper subset will have uh, either Lebesgue measure zero or lambda s, okay? So what about uh, non-atomic DSM? Non-atomic DSM is the one with uh, these two sigma algebras being non-atomic. Uh, some non-examples would be just the Lebesgue measure on, on L2 and R2. Okay. Uh, if you go back to this picture, you can see right away that you can shrink B as much as you like. 
and the A we train accordingly. Okay, that's that's the idea. Now, now some non-atomic DSMs are the following: the left invertible, and of course the right invertible DSM. And you can take the product of left of left invertible and right invertible Markov operators. You get something like this. This is also non-atomic. Okay, and the hairpin Markov operators. This is also non-atomic and more. Okay, so many of these have nice looking supports. Okay. Uh, it has something to do with singular DSM. So a singular measure is just a, a measure whose support has the big measure zero. Okay. And uh, in, in 1964 and 1965, Douglas and Linden Strauss, they proved that every extreme DSM is singular. And uh, because we we want to think of non-atomic as being a property of extreme DSM, and that's why we we, we prove that non-atomic DSM is singular. Okay. But this is a proper subset. If if you can see, uh, there are many many non-atomic. No, there are many singular. DSM, which is not non-atomic, and, and uh, we produce one of them here. Okay. The question is uh, whether the, the, the guess that we have from the beginning true or not. I mean, is, is it true that extreme implies non-atomic? Okay. And we, we're going to come back to this later in the very end. Okay. So what, what we did with non-atomic Markov operator is uh, we prove that if, if it's non-atomic, it can be factored as left invertible and right invertible Markov operators. But this, this factorization is not on the whole L1 space. It's only on the subspace of L1, being, being function measurable with respect to the sigma t. Sigma t defined earlier, okay? For example, if you look at this, this is our DSMT, uh, you can show that, or, or we can show that, this is a product of this T phi and this T psi adjoint, okay, on just a subspace of L1, not on the whole L1, okay. Uh, actually, this product here will be some, some DSM who support contain this thing, okay, Strict, strictly larger. So that, that's why we define uh, a factorizable Markov operator as a Markov operator factorizable as a product of left and right invertible. Okay? So by definition, all the left and all the right invertible Markov operators are factorizable uh, by taking one of them to be uh, two sided invertible. Okay? And we have some examples here. Okay. One of the examples is this, okay? Where you can take any, any T phi and any T phi star, you, you multiply them, you get non-atomic Markov operator always. Okay. And uh, this page contains some technical property of the factorizable Markov operator. Uh, the, the one I want you to, to look at is this. If you have a product of left invertible and right invertible Markov operators, then you take sigma t, this will be uh, completely determined by the psi here, okay? And if you take this product, uh, the sigma t star on the horizontal axis will be completely determined by this phi, okay? So the, the row of the sigma t and sigma t star, they, they, are, they can be separated by just phi and psi here. And what we, what we have next is involving the, the, the Markov operators with fractal support. So in, in 2005, there's a work by uh, Frederick Nelson and Rodriguez Lalina. They proved that there exists a Markov operator whose support is a fractal set with any arbitrary dimension, S. And the way we, they, they did it is by taking a matrix 
you can look at it as something like W stochastic matrix. And then you, you, you keep that there, there's going to be a, an iterative procedure that you keep doing it and it's going to converge to some Markov operator with fractal support like this. Okay, on the last slide. Yes, so part of this limiting process, we have dimension S. I mean, the S depends on this matrix here. I don't remember what S this is. Okay, anyway. And uh, so we, 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 we took a look at this and determined whether it's factorizable or not, or whether you can, you can write this factor set as a product of two factor sets. Okay, and in, in some cases, you can. Some cases, you can. So uh, if, if you uh, define what it means by this jointly decomposable matrix, uh, you can show that some of them can be factored as a product of left and right convertible. And we have a picture to show you. Like this factor set on the left can be factored as a left invertible. This one is a function, even though it doesn't look like one. And uh, the, the, the tr transpose of this is another one. Okay, you, you flip it around and you get this. The product of these two will be that on the, on the left side. Okay. It depends on ma many, many things. I mean, you, you have to be able to uh, separate this, this green area from the yellow area. So they, they cannot get too mixed up between the green and the yellow. Okay, there, there's some condition on this. But I, I only have sufficient condition. Then you can do that, but I don't have the uh, necessary condition. Okay. In, anyway, you can, you can factor uh, a DSM with fractal support this way in some cases. Now, then the question is, when, how can you know whether one a, a, a Markov operator can be factorizable? Okay, so we came up with a procedure. Okay, you take a non-atomic Markov operator T, and then the following procedure, we construct a factorizable Markov operator T prime that shares the same sigma algebras as T. Meaning this, the sigma algebras on, on on the horizontal axis and the vertical axis, they're gonna be the same as T, but the T prime and T might not be the same, okay? The process takes uh, the two major preserving functions, phi and psi, that generates the two sigma algebra. Then you compute this product. You, you're, you're gonna get invertible Markov operator. It's not clear with the, why this is invertible, but you can, you can prove it, okay? Then you take this S, and then you multiply back with T phi and T psi at joint. That's gonna be our T prime. And this T prime will have the same sigma algebra as T. And because of it, this T prime is a product of T phi and T psi star with uh, invertible S in the, in the middle, uh, this will be factorizable. So you can construct a factorizable T prime from T. So what's, what's the last thing you want to say? If this T prime is equal to T, we get factorizability. If it's not, then T is not factorizable. So this process will give you a way to determine whether you have a factorizable Markov operator or not. Okay. I'm holding this too long. <laughs> okay. For example, you take this T, uh, you take this T and then you construct the S, the S being the product of, of three Markov operators. You get this uh, invertible Markov operator here. And you take that invertible Markov operator and, and, and multiply back with the T phi and T psi at joint. You get the same T back. And this will give you how you can factorize this as a product of left and right, invertible, okay? Uh, on the other hand, if you, if you start with this, T, then you're gonna 
take this S being this the product of this three. I mean, how how we came up with this two? This is just a long complication because you have to compute what the sigma algebras of this T is first on 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 both axes, and then from from those sigma algebras you can pick a function measurable with uh, respect to those sigma algebras, and then take this as a as a Markov operator, which is right invertible and left invertible, multiply them all to get this. Okay, this is the identity. And then you take this and multiply back with the left invertible on the left and right invertible on the right. You get something very nice, but clearly not the same as T. So T and T will not be factorizable. So what's the use of this? If, if it's already factorizable, you can show it by just write it as a product of this and this, right? But if it's not factorizable, this is the way to do it. Okay? So the, the application of this is to some DSM, which is not that simple. And uh, they are DSM supported in a hairpin. So this, this is the double, st double stochastic measure, which is uh, extreme in the sense that it, it, it's not a convex sum of two other DSM, okay? And it's constructed by taking a simple function, H, okay? H being increasing homeomorphism on zero one, and HX has to be less than X, so the graph is something like this. That's H. And take the H inverse of this, this will be the support of, a, of the DSM with hairpin support, okay? And we're gonna call this DSM full hairpin DSM if the support is the whole, the whole thing. Usually, the support of the, of the DSM can be just a proper subset of these two graphs. But we, when, we, when we say full, it means the whole thing will be the support, okay? Now, in the 1988, there exists at most one DSM whose support is in the graph of H and S inverse, at most one. So the support determines the DSM. But for some H, this, this DSM doesn't exist, meaning there is some su sufficient condition for existence that you have to check. But if, if H is this, Meaning it's, it's the, the quarter circle, okay? Then DSM ex exists, okay? Now, uh, this hairpin DSM is ex extensively studied as extreme DSM, which is not the usual DSM, okay? It's, it has no analogs in the W stochastic matrices at all. So what we did is we take a full happy DSMs and then show that the, it's always non-atomic and not factorizable. Okay, example would be something like this. And how do we show that this is not factorizable? We take this and we construct uh, through the process, construct the, the, the left invertible and the right invertible. They're gonna be like something like this. Do not ask me what these functions are because, I mean, I use computer to, to generate this graph, okay? But if you multiply this two, there will be some extra line along this area, and therefore they are not equal to this, so it's not factorizable, okay? So, so far we, we, we have a factorizability criteria for this thing, okay? Then we guess uh, whether we have this for all extreme DSM. Whether all DSM, all extreme DSM has to be non-atomic or whether extreme DSM has to be, uh, what, factorizable. If we go back, let me, let me bring you back. Here. 
Now that's a question involving uh, extreme points of the set of Markov operators and the factorizability, whether they are they have any relation. And and the relation that we have here is just that uh, there is some extreme MOs or extreme Markov operators which is not factorizable, and there are some factorizable Markov operators which is not extreme. Okay, so what we did show is. There is no extreme DSM which is factorizable. Okay, so they are separated from each other. If it's extreme, then it's not factorizable. I mean, the, the only exception is that when you have either phi or psi being two sided invertible. If one of them is two sided invertible, then, then it's going to be just the left invertible Markov operator or, or right invertible Markov operator. That's all. And, and, and that's surely extreme okay so if you exclude those cases then every extreme DSM will not be strictly factorizable okay and with this we can take this and show a, 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 a final result saying that every DSM that has strictly factorizable rectangular component meaning if you take a DSM and if, if, if this DSM has components, meaning something like in this part of the DSM, the support is factorizable, then it cannot be extreme. So that, that's, that's clearly follow from, from the theorem. Okay? Look like a span. Anyway, and we also have the last is, uh, if you remember, uh, we have this question earlier, whether extreme implies non-atomicity of a DSM. And uh, then finally, we found an example that there exists an extreme DSM that is totally atomic meaning it does, it's not non-atomic at all, okay? And this, this example is quite non-constructive. You cannot construct it explicitly, okay? And, and, and that's all the work that I have done on, on this subject for the past few years. Okay. And that's it. Very good question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess I expect this question, but never find a good answer. <laughs> Actually, my, my, my first proposition, let me go back. Yeah. The thing is, I, I started working with this because of the non-atomicity of a Markov operator. And this non-atomicity is, is, is defined uh, from uh, an earlier work by Darsaw. Okay? And then I came up with this partial factorization that if you have non-atomic Markov operator, it can be factorized as a product of left and right invertible but on only a special, or on a subclass of L1. So that's, that's, that's when I ask whether, when can one factorize it on the whole space? Okay, if, if this is only a subspace, when can we factorize it as a product on the whole, sub, on the whole space of L1? Okay, and, and then it started from there. But I don't have any application briefly. <laughs>